Welcome to The Rot Focus, a podcast for writers, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Writers, Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, grab a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. Welcome to the fifth season of The Right Focus, the podcast for writers of all types, newbies and veterans, and everyone in between. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. We are justifiably proud of achieving this fifth season. We started in 2020, that dreadful year, so good things do come from bad ones. Apart from our yearly hiatus in the hectic Decembers, we haven't missed a weekly episode. This week, we officially open this season with episode 198. How was that for meeting deadlines? Ooh, ooh, ooh. We start our fifth season with the first of the last episodes on the greatest plot structure in the world, taken from our host M.A. Lee's craft guide, Discovering Plot. In this episode, we delve into stages 9 and 10 of the 12-stage archetypal story pattern. Stage 9 is the protagonist's reward for surviving the trials and the dark ordeal. Our main characters still have a difficult journey ahead, yet stage 9 gives a respite. Then we descend to stage 10, the road back. Seemingly straightforward, but still tricksy, still twisty, still dangerous. This wave-like up-and-down pattern of events all through the archetypal story pattern creates pacing and tension. The writers offer rewards to keep the readers from tumbling off the journey. The troubles continue to offer angst and suspense for reader engagement. Don't make the mistake of cheap thrills and unthinking, uncaring sacrifices now that you've brought the reader this far. Love has an emotional reward. Danger and death have consequences. Justice cannot be totally blind. Logic still has to hold up. There must be reasons for actions. If we keep the reader engaged all through these stages... Our reader will be satisfied at the very end, and we, the writer, will be satisfied, too, because we want to keep writing, not burn out and burn up our love of storytelling. Now, on to this week's episode. Stage 9, The Reward, Joy After Darkness Endurance requires rewards. When Voldemort kills Harry Potter in Deathly Hallows Part 2, Harry enters a threshold existence, a waiting station. Dearly beloved Dumbledore is there, and we and Harry discover three things. First, Voldemort, the half-blood prince, is nearly dead. His horcrux soul attached to Harry is dying. Only the horcrux and the python remains. Once that is destroyed, Voldemort's physical being can be killed. Two, Death is a transition. Harry can choose to move on or return and fulfill all of his earthly destiny. 3. Everything that has happened. The tortuous years at Hogwarts and with his aunt and uncle, Hermione's wiping her existence from her parents' memories, Dobby's sacrificial death and the multi-layered loss of Sirius Black, all have purpose. The multiple sacrifices of the deer will lead to a greater and freer existence. Friendship, loyalty, and love brought Harry through the battles. These three are the ultimate reward, a reward that Voldemort mocks. Someone said in reaction to the White Station scene with Dumbledore, it's all been worth it. Now we know. This is reminiscent of Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The treasure that helps us endure. For Anne Elliot in Jane Austen's Persuasion, 
Frederick Wentworth's renewed love will help her endure the last few days with her atrocious family. Through the ordeal, she intellectually and emotionally divorced herself from her old life. In the reward, she looks to the potential of the future. In the 13th Warrior, the Vendal mother is dead. The warriors escape from the inescapable lair. They lost comrades. Their leader is dying. They must still battle the Wendal leader, but they can taste success and they begin to reap the rewards. This is especially true for Ibn, who did not understand the warrior code. He understands it now. When the culminating battle approaches, he now fully understands the purification prayer he was taught and the Northmen's invocation of blood. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. As audience, as writers, we relish the moment of the reward even as we anticipate the last three stages, the road back, the resurrection of both evil and the protagonist, and the return with the elixir. It's time, we may think, for this to be over. We want that first sip of the elixir. Hold on. Stay in the reward moment. Our audience, our protagonist, and we writers, we all need that reward. The reward requires the same consideration as the approach to the inmost cave. We have three things to do for the reward, plus one more. In the approach, our protagonists acknowledge their increasing transformation as they rejected any return to the ordinary world and their destroyed deers, now known as faults. Here in stage nine, our protagonists achieve the last necessary change to themselves, to their goals, and to their desires. Achieve does not mean a change occurs. Instead, protagonists can grasp their transformed goal, their new deer. In approach, that goal and the deer were merely contemplated as the once enticing old ones were rejected. Now the lover embraces his beloved, the king steps foot in his restored realm, the fighter sees justice again in play instead of trampled under vengeful foot. The reward is tangible, a living and pulsing reality that proves it's all been worth it. Now we know. Ordeal versus reward. As the ordeal was all out hatred, the reward is all out love. The protagonists bask in celebration at achieving the new deer. And the new deer is welcoming, joyful in contemplation of union with the protagonist. To continue any conflict between the protagonist and the new deer is to frustrate the audience. This is the power of Dumbledore in the reward of the Deathly Hallows Part 2. He proves all points of the juxtaposition of Harry with Voldemort in the ordeal. This is Anne Elliot's return home in Persuasion, in the old world as she anticipates the new and quite happy as she rejects completely the old. Thirteenth warrior gives with one hand as it takes with the other. One great defeat waits upon the next. One heroic victory waits on a heroic death. Bulbi is rewarded. Oh, not with King Vortigern's promised treasures and the great funeral bonfire that a hero deserves. There is more, little brother, as Herger says. With the queen's quick look around at the king's promise, we know more than gold and weapons will pass with Bulvi through that bonfire into Valhalla. A similar both-handed ordeal and reward occurs in the return of the king with Ilvan. As she killed the Nazgul and its rider, she lost her beloved uncle. In her reward, she has wounds to recover from and discovers a worthy man to recover with. The Difficult Reward For protagonists like Harry Potter, who did not defeat the antagonist during the ordeal. The culminating conflict occurs in stage 11, the resurrection. If the protagonist failed spectacularly in the ordeal, they are now prisoners of the antagonistic force. Continuing to live is not the reward. Sorry, writers, it's not that easy. The reward provides opportunities for the miraculous, the shadowy magical, hinted at but never seen until this moment. A beloved ally may sacrifice himself to save the protagonist, as in Dobby. 
the stone heart finally cracks, the ice finally melts. Information so desperately needed earlier becomes available now. Or the untrusted shapeshifter becomes trustworthy. The trickster's earlier trick percolates for hours, days, weeks, and finally works out, exploding the imprisoning cage. The impossible escape becomes possible through the others that the protagonist gathered earlier, the Thundercliffs of the 13th Warrior. To Queen Elizabeth in the first season of The Crown, Episode 7, the professor reminds her that she studied with the finest constitutional scholar of England. You know all the fine points of our Constitution, he tells her. You know more than anyone else. And this young woman, whom the world perceived as weak and lesser and not intellectual, realizes that she is more than anyone imagined, anyone including herself. Elizabeth reaches an understanding that she had, but didn't comprehend. It is not my job to govern, but it is my job to ensure proper governance. The reward is for our protagonist, our audiences, and ourselves as writers. Be in the moment and don't race through it. The last three stages belong to the last segment of the archetypal story pattern, Return and Reintegration. The key to the antagonist ultimate defeat is found. Second, the protagonists have their dear and a new resolve and a new determination to achieve their goal. And three, the protagonists think as individuals, not as the group taught them to think. Stage 10, The Road Back, Driving to Destiny. As we head into The Road Back and the last section of the archetypal story pattern. How are we doing? In the past 80% of story, we've 1. Transformed the protagonist. 2. Changed their goals into new deers. 3. Provided a transformed deer to the protagonist as rewards. 4. Given them worthy allies. 5. Defeated villains and elements of the antagonistic force. 6. Overcome fears and evils, exterior and interior. My goodness, what else must we do? The hardest thing. We must truly defeat the antagonist and then find our way back home, wherever home now represents. Easy enough. Well, no. And not because the antagonistic force is still out there, a maelstrom of chaotic evil. Here's our big question. How do we find the right road back? Driving with the old deer. The deer destroyed at the call to adventure is not the deer of the reward. This deer is transformed, just as the protagonist is transformed. The transformation of the reward is clearly evident in Cast Away, the film with Tom Hanks and Helen Hunt. Hanks' character Chuck survives the deprivation and extreme loneliness only because returning to his lost love, Hunt and Acton Kelly, became his goal. Yet he transformed. He learned to be in the moment instead of always working toward a future deadline. He learned to appreciate the smallest of miracles and to heed obscure signs. Chuck needs someone as his dear who is also open to these hidden yet highly significant realities. Kelly is not that person. And we discover that in the scene where he is reunited with her. In Castaway, the road back begins with the celebration at the airport, then continues through his visit to her house. Chuck's visit to Kelly also launches into the resurrection, the stage of story where evil recurs that endangers the protagonist. Since the two stages are so closely intertwined in this film, I'll discuss both. Just know that the road back is their attempt at reconnection, while the resurrection is the acceptance of the need to part. Castaway actually has a two-part road back and a two-part resurrection. The last scene, Chuck in the Jeep, reveals the return with the elixir of his essential new self. Chuck no longer matches his old dear Kelly. At Kelly's house, Chuck is in the moment of their reunion, 
but Kelly can't face their reunion. First, she is not able to meet him at the airport. Then, when he comes to her house, she is continually doing something as a distraction, showing him a car and a map, fiddling with housework. She is focused on him, but also on all the things between them. Twice, she looks hard at him, as if not able to believe that this man before her is her old love returned to her. He is physically changed. He is also mentally and spiritually changed, although these changes are not as easily observed. He comments on the miracle of her child. Her response is a criticism. Children are miracles, not things to be managed. They are the blessing of the future with the wonder of the now. Instead, Kelly dismisses any conversation about her child by saying something like, She's a mess. Chuck heeds the sign. Kelly is blind to them. She must blind herself to them or abandon the life she built without him. She makes her decision. Yet when he drives away, she still clings to her past and calls him back. She kept their car, another sign of her clinging to the past. Kelly is static, stagnant, bitter with the losses, not transformed by them. She abandoned her greatest goal, without saying goodbye to it. We admire Kelly. We want her to reunite with Chuck. They are each other's love of my life, but they're not right for each other. Maybe they never were, even before Chuck transformed. We grieve with them as they part. Driving on the right road to the new deer. We don't grieve at the end of Castaway when Chuck meets the Angel Wings lady, we want him to connect with her. See, we know he doesn't belong to Kelly. Look at his brief yet revelatory encounter with the Angel Wings lady. She is in the moment. When giving directions, she focuses on him, she makes eye contact, and then she flows forward like water and time. She appreciates blissful moments. Art is itself a blissful miracle and she chose as her mark the triple-haloed angel wings. Her FedEx package, marked with the triple-haloed angel wings, is the only package that Chuck did not open. Even with the breakup of her marriage, exhibited by the sign at the ranch's entrance with the ex-husband's name obliterated from it, the angel wings lady maintains her connection to the miraculous. Just as Chuck's survival was a series of miracles, their meeting here at the film's end is another example of a hidden significance that could be easily overlooked. She heeds the signs. She recognizes Chuck as being directionless. Without giving him a direction, she ensures he knows the way. The broken ranch sign bears witness that she saw the signs of her husband's infidelity and took action. In a neat circular construction, our evidence of the husband's infidelity occurs at the film's beginning. A Russian FedEx worker delivers an angel wing package to a man in a cowboy hat and bathrobe. He, however, has a scantily clad woman with him. He even comments that the package is from his wife. Bad cad. The angel wings lady has faced a devastation similar to Chuck's although not as extreme or traumatic. The ranch sign reveals the anger of her husband's betrayal and their divorce. Living on the desolate prairie, she understands deprivation and priorities, yet she chooses beauty over bitterness. Chuck will choose it as well. Castaway deprives the audience of an extended elixir, but do we really need it? Our imaginations work just fine. How to find the right road back. The task is not as difficult as it seems. In the Deathly Hallows Part 2, Harry just has to return his soul from the White Station to his body in the forest. Easy peasy. For 13th Warrior, the Vindal come to the Northmen who have prepared the same courage as before. We do have that lovely invocation of blood as they call on preceding generations of warriors, male and female, 
to strengthen them and to inspire them. Lo, there do I see my people, back to the beginning. With return of the king, Aragorn releases the dead men of Dunharrow, rejecting arrogance and corruptible power, which Gimli doesn't understand, but Legolas views with awed approval. Pride and Prejudice hath Darcy persuade Wickham to marry Lydia. Elizabeth hath the culminating battle with Lady Catherine de Bourgh. The road back starts the protagonist's journey to the elixir, the ultimate reward. What is necessary to gain that elixir? First step, start tying up the loose ends now. Determine the best sequence. What needs to remain until the ultimate battle? What would provide humor after that battle? What can be a little angsty for the secondary characters before the last battle begins? Or going into the last battle? Second step. Show the protagonist's match to the new desired deer while not matching to the old destroyed deer. Third step. Give evidence of the protagonist's transformation. What scene will show the contrast between the protagonist at the beginning and now here at the end? Fourth step. Never forget that the antagonist believes his way is the right way. Audiences who become transfixed by the antagonist might need a reminder of their particular evil, as well as that evil's effect on the protagonist, the team of allies, and the dear goal. Fifth step. Has a secondary character taken precedence and deserves a sequel? Set up the sequel now with little hints of a driving goal for them. Sixth step. The protagonist arc should be complete. Has that transformation been shown? Seventh step. End the road back by casting the protagonist and the new desired deer back into jeopardy. Castaway breaks the mold but still teaches the pattern. Castaway packs a lot into the extended scene that is both road back and resurrection before shifting to the culminating scene that concludes the film. The elixir is also broken into two parts. The road back is his workplace reunion at the airport followed by his reunion with Kelly at her home. Kelly's second rejection is the first part of the resurrection. Evil is reborn. Rather than defeating the resurrected evil, it is accepted. The protagonist continues on. What else is Chuck supposed to do? Remove Kelly forcibly from the life she's chosen? Tempt her away from that life, proving his selfishness by destroying a family? No. The film moves to the second part of the resurrection, the resurrection of the protagonist, reborn after the defeat by evil. Chuck talks with the friend that he didn't realize was so loyal. To him, he grieves for his loss of Kelly, and his friend listens and sympathizes and empathizes. Chuck shares that Kelly was his goal, the deer he lost when he washed up on that island, a goal he lost all over again when she chose her fallback life rather than the difficulties required to restore a life with him. This presents the sequence needed to cut the ties to his old life, his road back, and the antagonist that deprives him of the deer he wanted, resurrection. Then we see Truck's transformation. He apologizes to his friend for not being there when his friend's wife died of cancer. This contrasts him with the Chuck of the beginning, the one who is driven by work. He had barely acknowledged this information at the beginning of the film. His transformed self, however, reaches out to the miracle of friendship. The busy Chuck would not have cared about the friend's agony in the slow loss of his wife. And then he's on the road, resurrected anew, drinking water, heading to his own unexpected and miraculous end where he will have the chance to drink the elixir of the gods. The scene with Kelly is Chuck's road back, yet it is also the resurrection of evil that deprives him of his cherished goal. For a brief moment, we the audience want Kelly to be with Chuck. We grieve with Chuck. And then Angel Wings Lady helps us realize that Chuck and Kelly no longer fit when we consider the protagonist's transforming journey and the new deer they now treasure, 
the road to bring everything back home should pave itself. Like the fabled yellow brick road, the road back becomes a curving journey to the elixir. Yet a horrible obstacle remains, the resurrection of evil. And that's in the next section. What do writers want to know about plot? What do writers need to know about plot? The right focus is taking a comprehensive view of plot, the structure that develops characters, genre expectations, major story structures, pacing, tension, suspense. We cover it all in this series entitled Discovering Your Plot from M.A. Lee's Guidebook of the Same Name. Writers will discover unexpected insights and methods that deepen their understanding of this major craft in the storytelling world. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by M.A. Lee from Writers, Inc. Books, assisted by Rennie Black and Edie Rooms. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps, and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.